All right. All right, everybody. Th thank you, everybody, and welcome back to the third talk of our uh, afternoon session. Uh, so this talk is going to be by, again, our very own uh, Guillaume Dumas, who just joined here, uh, the wonderful community in Montreal. If you haven't noticed, there's um, we're doing a little bit of neuro AI flexing here. Like, obviously, we're having a strong community in Montreal, and we're showcasing all of the amazing talents that we've recruited in the past year. So Puya is one, uh, Guillaume is one, Jan is another one. So we're very, very happy and proud to showcase all of these newcomers. And so uh, Guillaume Dumas uh, is an assistant professor uh, that newly joined the computational psychiatry in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Montreal. And he's the principal investigator of the Precision Psychiatry and Social Physiology Lab at the CHU St. Justine Research Center. Uh, following the completion of his PhD in Cogneuro, he held an appointment as a permanent researcher in the neuroscience and computational biology at the Institut Pasteur in Paris, France. His current research aims at cross-fertilizing AI and ML, cognitive neuroscience, and digital medicine through an interdisciplinary program. He combines approaches from computational biology and social neuroscience to pave the way for predictive, preventive, personalized, and prescriptive and practice participatory medicine. Wow, there's a lot of <laughs> adjectives there. He has received various awards, including the Prix Jeune Chercheur EU Ames. So it's a pleasure for, uh, for us to have you with us, Guillaume. And uh, today, uh, Guillaume is going to talk to us about, uh, the title of his talk is From Social Psychology to Social Neuro AI. So without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, Guillaume. Thank you so much, uh, Guillaume. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer to uh, have put out uh, such an amazing conference. Uh, it's a bit sad to be uh, only uh, online, but uh, a great honor and uh, happy uh, to be here. But quite intimidating, too, because of the uh, great speaker that we have uh, uh, during the, those two days. Uh, so uh, I would like to first thank all the people that had the, I had the chance to collaborate uh, and the funding also uh, that support uh, what I'm going to present. And it's kind of connect with the topic also of today because uh, my research tend to uh, demonstrate how our individual uh, is shaped, our individuality is shaped by our social interaction and through others like uh, uh, Ubuntu, I'm, I am because you are. Uh, in the in the in research itself and uh it's another uh it's also very special for me to to speak at main uh 2020 because actually attending main uh, 2019 last year was part of uh the decision uh well of the chain of causality that uh participated in my decision to move to montreal and i got my key of the office last week so it's kind of and i have a now a canadian shirt uh, and so, as you uh, explained already, Guillaume, uh, my team is entitled uh, Precision Psychiatry and Social Physiology. And I will try today to address the question how uh, understanding the social brain can be uh, important for the future of AI. And so uh, it's one of the, uh, the three axes of the lab, uh, which is like social neuro AI. But first, uh, I will speak about uh, social physiology and how during the last 10 years, I have tried to develop uh, a naturalization of social interaction and uh, addressing uh, some metaphorically uh, said the problem of the dark matter of neuroscience, which is social interaction. And 10 years ago, there were not so much uh, papers and studies addressing uh, two individuals engaged in dynamical interaction. So they were like a kind of a blank spot uh, in uh, social neuroscience there. And um, I, I will uh, close at the end about the same diagram, but uh, for artificial intelligence. But so for now, uh, basically the, the strategy that I adopted during the, those last 10 years for naturalizing social interaction combined human-human uh, and computational models uh, and mixed human and computational model interaction. So like since we are after lunch for some of the people, uh, is the simplified version, so brain with brain, uh, models with models, and uh, brain with models. And starting with the brain with brains, uh, I uh, first uh, tried to investigate what's going on during uh, ecological 
in social interaction where you have a spontaneous uh, negotiation of the turn taking and uh, you are uh, not, I would say, in a representational, uh, like no economic uh, type of interaction, but more sensory model type of interaction, like uh, in imitation here. And so uh, by recording the two brains during this social interaction, we were able first to uh, demonstrate something that may appear obvious to most of you, that actually social interaction is categorically different from social perception, and that actually our brains uh, react differently and are active in a different way, uh, depending on the role that we are taking in the social interaction and the context uh, this uh, interaction unfold. So that was at the intra-brain level. And uh, at that time, so it was uh, my PhD project, uh, I had the chance to be in a, in a lab that uh, pioneered uh, the metaphor of the uh, network for the brain with like uh, this uh, famous uh, paper of uh, Francisco Varela, the brain wave, where they were comparing uh, at that time um, the brain as uh, Napster. So it was already a peer-to-peer uh, kind of metaphor and showing how uh, synchronization between uh, cell assembly could be a, a functional uh, mechanism for uh, information integration. And meanwhile, uh, I was also building upon these uh, uh, developments regarding uh, another aspect of uh, Francisco Varela in, in, in link with uh, um, Umberto Maturana, uh, which is like uh, how uh, we are coupled with the environment, including our social environment, and how social cognition is not uh, restricted to our, what is appearing in our skull, but actually imply our body and also our social embedding. And uh, building on, on those uh, conceptual uh, aspects, uh, we design also inter-individual analysis, trying to uh, get neuroscience at the interbrain level and we were able to demonstrate uh, interbrain synchronization during social interaction. In that case, during this uh, imitation, spontaneous imitation involving nonverbal uh, hand movements. Uh, but over the years, so it was uh, quite uh, hard to publish because it was sort of a, a new type of uh, neural correlates. But uh, after uh, years, uh, we have been also demonstrating that this kind of marker can be uh, observed in also uh, verbal interaction and our language can help synchronizing a uh, two nervous system during social uh, exchange. And how those uh, brain, uh, interbrain synchronization are modulated by the task, by the familiarity between the people, and even uh, at, in the case of um, arrhythmic interaction, because uh, one of the, the, the issue was that to what extent doing the same behavior in a rhythmic fashion would entrain the two brains uh, to the same rhythm. And so uh, basically how spurious the synchrony were. And we show uh, with Pavel Goldstein uh, and uh, people in Israel, uh, Aifa, how actually even with uh, affective touch, which is totally arrhythmic, uh, we can have uh, this uh, physiological uh, resonance between people and how this marker is uh, indicative of also uh, phenomenon like uh, uh, pain reduction based on uh, affective touch, which was uh, very interesting to show. And so uh, overall, this kind of uh, show how uh, beyond just uh, the individual cognition, we have this uh, coupling uh, in the social realm and uh, a, a big question, and uh, I was super happy to see a philosopher uh, implicated in, in Maine 2020, because uh, uh, in, in this paper with Mel Fairhurst, we try to uh, conceptually and use philosophy to also discuss the potential uh, source of spurious uh, uh, factor of this synchronization. Uh, we, have, we are measuring simultaneously uh, similarity of dynamics because we are measuring uh, brains and so they tend to be similar even without interaction and this similarity can uh, be unfolding uh, at the biological at the behavioral and also at cultural level but uh, also we are measuring exchange of uh, information through communication whether it is unidirectional or reciprocal and um, 
the, the, the problem here is that as actually culture is shaped through uh, communication between different agents, but it's also through our neurobiology that we are able to uh, communicate with others. So they are like uh, this dub double constraint between this uh, similarity and communication. And so that was for more like the, the physiological aspect, which is connected to physiology in the sense of Claude Bernard, which is uh, to, uh, instead of looking at the specific scale, uh, try to have a systemic understanding of a function. Uh, and uh, now I, I will try to move to more computational oriented work associated with my uh, IVADO mandate in Montreal and what I want to develop actually at, at MILA and how we can uh, use this uh, social neuroscience uh, towards uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, it starts with social computational neuroscience and with the, the first uh, paper simulating two brains in interaction for, for that work. Uh, I took uh, what's called the, the connectomes, which is uh, how you reconstruct based on uh, DTI, so tensor imaging of fibers that connect uh, brain area. Uh, you can uh, reconstruct the anatomical backbone of the brain. And interestingly, you can use that uh, to simulate uh, brain at the individual level. But uh, the, the beauty of uh, in silico work and computer science is that you can copy paste your metrics and you have two brains uh, for the price of one. And here the idea was to uh, already try to address this question of factor of similarity and exchange of, of information by investigating what is the, um, the impact of uh, anatomy in the, the entire brain uh, synchronization that we were empirically observing. And so we create in silico these two brains and uh, connecting the motor region of one brain with the visual region of the other brain and vice versa, creating this sensory motor loop between the two brains. And uh, to be able to compare uh, those uh, brain, uh, virtual brains with empirical data, we had to go at the scalp level. So using a, a brainstorm at the time uh, by Sylvain Bayet, uh, we were able to uh, do a forward modeling that uh, moved from the cortical level to the scalp level and generate uh, fake EEG signals or virtual EEG signals that we can compare to the real data. And uh, actually it was uh, quite performing well. So at both uh, phase locking value within brain and hyper phase locking value between brain, our simulated uh, uh, data were quite a fit with uh, the real one. And we were able to replicate uh, known uh, results at the intra-brain level. So for instance, how uh, if we measure the, the synchronization within brain with the same real anatomy compared to a uh, random shuffled anatomy, uh, we show that the topology of the real brain was uh, a good uh, compromise for uh, at the cost of wiring for the diversity of dynamical states and uh, kind of smoothing out the phase transition between order and disorder and like improving the range uh, where uh, the brain can function between uh, being in epileptic seizure or uh, totally uh, uh, dissociated. And uh, actually it echo well with the uh, work of uh, Daniel Bassett, of course, and uh, also recent work at Mila with Laura Suarez, Guillaume Lajoie, Black Richard, and What's Left Music. Uh, so here it was at the intra-brain level, but so at the inter-brain level, what we show is that actually uh, the shape, the, the topology of the anatomy uh, of the individual brain was facilitating uh, the resonance between brains. And so uh, beyond uh, just uh, facilitating integration of information within brain, uh, the, the human connectum tend to facilitate uh, sensory motor resonance between individuals. And uh, you can see uh, in, the, in the diagram that actually uh, by shuffling the anatomy, we still have a spurious residual synchronization. And what's interesting is to uh, actually measure the difference between the upper right part of the blue curve and the uh, left uh, point of the blue curve, which is the, the amount of synchronization uh, related to the coupling between the brains. And so when we normalize 
by the even the intra-brain uh, coupling, so uh, within brain uh, phase locking value, we show that the real anatomy indeed potentiates this uh, uh, synchronization between individuals, uh, even compared to uh, having the same structure but uh, randomized. So it's not the fact that the two systems uh, share the same topology. The topology itself of the real hum human brain have an effect as an effect on this uh, resonance. And uh, it has kind of uh, consequences and uh, um, uh, interesting ramification uh, for uh, psychiatry because uh, we are uh, allowed to think that uh, this kind of uh, misattunement at the anatomical level can propagate at the cognitive behavioral and sociocultural level. And in the case of a certain condition like autism, uh, actually without pinpointing one specific brain area or one specific gene, uh, this could be one way of explaining the neurodiversity and how it impacts the social uh, ability of uh, connecting with others. So uh, overall, this show that you can address uh, experimentally and computationally uh, social interaction in a principal way. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, the, those different scales share a, a phenomenon at the dynamical uh, level. Hi, everybody. I think we have a little connection problem. Please uh, hang on, stay put. We'll be uh, back shortly. Hey. Did this disconnect? Yeah. Yeah, you look great. And uh, what slide did it, uh, did it stop? Did it stop? Uh, it stopped maybe like uh, uh, 30 seconds ago. So so at the uh, dynamical system glue? Uh, I believe so, yes. Like that? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So we are live again? Yes, yes. we're live. Uh, you can just um, carry on. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, the, the web jumped. Um, so yeah, uh, what I was saying is uh, dynamical systems formalism is a good agnostic glue for having a multi-scale approach of uh, human cognition. And that was a kind of a motivation to go uh, in Florida working with uh, Scott Kelso's lab. And um, part of my work there was to use uh, this formalism of dynamical systems to build up uh, artificial agent not based on uh, traditional cognitive system or cognitive architecture, but more like an artificial agent that is uh, grounded in dynamical systems. And so here it's a nonverbal uh, Turing test between a human and an avatar that is controlled by uh, real time uh, uh, differential equations. And we were able to show that. Uh, this avatar is able to uh, pass the, the Turing test in a nonverbal way. And on top, to uh, uh, be a good uh, crash test for investigating uh, impact of dynamics and uh, sensory motor coupling 
on more uh, subjective aspect of social cognition, whether it is like attribution of uh, cooperativeness to the others or uh, even the judgment of humanness. And here, for instance, one very interesting uh, result was that actually changing the, the difficulty of the task was uh, uh, forcing uh, people to believe that the other agent was uh, less cooperative uh, with a, a more difficult uh, condition, while mathematically the agent was exactly the same in the same way uh, cooperative, which is would be hard to do with humans, but with this kind of uh, uh, dynamic clamp at the human scale, uh, can open up uh, empirical uh, protocol, uh, empirical design. But uh, we are we were interested also in the bridging the neural scale and the behavioral scale. And so combining uh, this uh, human dynamic clamp with EEG and identity EEG actually, we were uh, able to investigate it. What are the neural networks during the ongoing interaction that are uh, associated with cell behavior and other behavior? And uh, first for the cell behavior, we replicated uh, MEG results from uh, Karim Jabi uh, that were uh, in my previous lab actually. And, uh, but with this uh, human dynamic, we were also able to uh, track in real time uh, to what extent certain brain region are integrating self and other information uh, during the ongoing uh, interaction. And we found that the, the right temporal parietal junction, that is uh, a brain region uh, well known uh, in the literature of uh, social neuroscience, uh, seems to be a hub between the self and other representation. And uh, instead of having uh, RTPJ as an active or dis uh, disactivate brain region, here it's more that you have two coherent dynamics that converge on this brain region. And by averaging, you tend to have more activity there. But uh, the picture that we found is more uh, subtle than just more activity in RTPJ. And this uh, RTPJ uh, STS uh, area with, between the self and other was uh, even more interestingly connecting with a uh, frontal region during uh, cooperation versus competition attribution or judgment of humanness uh, in the Turing test. So kind of bridging this system one type of sensory motor coupling with a more like system two uh, attribution of intention and representation of others. And so that brings me to my last, uh, my last part, which is more like the perspective uh, related to neuro-AI and, and social neuro-AI. And actually addressing this uh, paradox uh, between this system one and system two. Because uh, in, in social neuroscience, uh, there are these two community uh, working on social cognition, one more centered on mirroring, sensory motor coupling, which is more like embodied and interactionist, and a community that is more system two about metacognition, mentalizing uh, language and representation. And we argue that actually these two things are connected in a chicken egg type of relationship. Uh, because you need representation of others to interact with them, but it's true interaction with others that you are shaping uh, this representation. And this kind of uh, paradox uh, emerge in a way because we are concentrating on uh, only a few scales that are at play in the complex uh, phenomenon of social cognition. And if we take that in the, in the case of psychiatry and how the National Institute of Mental Health uh, tends to uh, uh, create a grid of interpretation of uh, or more dimensional approach of uh, uh, cognition. Uh, we are here just integrating behavior and physiology while there are many other dimensions such as genetics and cellular scales uh, and the social level above that are also uh, to take into account. And uh, computational psychiatry is, is a good uh, uh, way of seeing the, the, the bias because we can see in these uh, research domain criteria how behavior and cognitive systems are where all the papers are. And uh, there is this kind of era here, there be dragon, where there is not so much work that has been done. And it involves sensory motor system and social processes in the lower uh, levels of organization. And so psychiatry and multiscale uh, disorders uh, or conditions like uh, uh, autism are uh, an ideal uh, uh, topic to address these uh, multiple scales because 
we have a clear uh, phenotype for um, involving social cognition. And uh, meanwhile, we have also uh, very uh, robust and replicated uh, molecular uh, results showing how at the single gene level we can perturbate uh, this social uh, cognitive ability. And another uh, way of uh, looking at this different scale is also through the lens of uh, evolution and human evolution. And uh, Michael Graziano uh, put it in a very uh, interesting way that the same brain region and computational processing that are at use in a social context to attribute awareness to someone else are also used in a continuous basis to construct your own awareness and attribute it to yourself. And so understanding the molecular and uh, cellular and physiological mechanisms of social cognition could ultimately lead also to insights about uh, self-awareness and uh, metacognition at the individual level. And that brought me to uh, neurogenetics. And uh, I conducted during the last five years, the first systematic screening of uh, evolutionary uh, measure at all the genome across Homo sapiens, archaic hominidae, and other primates to understand where evolution have uh, act as a act in the brain. And so uh, one surprising result was actually that uh, the brain was surprisingly very conserved. Uh, what the genes that were more uh, divergent uh, overall uh, were more like genes that, uh, um, associated with olfaction and immune system that are uh, parameters that are changing a lot in the environment. And so you need at the evolutionary level to adapt fast to that. But actually for the uh, brain, uh, it's quite uh, strikingly conserved. Uh, but using uh, uh, public data set like uh, the Allen Brain Atlas and NeuroVolt, we were still able to compare where the, diver the, the divergent genes, so the genes that have evolved, uh, may be expressed in the brain and uh, to what extent they are correlating with specific tasks. And we show that indeed it correlates with study involving social cognition, including language. And it's like uh, on uh, the NeuroVolt uh, database. And uh, we have some signals actually in the Broca area. We need uh, another Allen Brain Atlas to replicate the results, unfortunately. But uh, it's interesting to see that already overall uh, genes that have evolved in Homo sapiens tend to be uh, expressed in the same brain region that uh, are uh, activated during uh, social cognition. But uh, as I say, a striking result was that the brain overall is quite conserved compared to the rest of the uh, body. It's uh, actually one of the most conserved organ uh, in the body. And it may be imputable to the synapse because one does not touch synaptic function. Basically, the synapse is a very old uh, molecular uh, mechanism and uh, you can break it very easily and most of the core genes implicated at the synaptic level seems to be super super conserved. So we try to have another lens by uh, using the Allen Brain Atlas again and find out where in the sub region of the nervous system uh, evolutionary uh, pressure could have uh, been at, at play and we show that actually uh, the cerebellum, which is a bit uh, underrated in uh, neuroimaging, sometimes uh, they are even it's even cropped uh, in fMRI study, and some people would even say that cerebellum is just a, a way to avoid the the head to fall uh, forward. But actually, there are now growing uh, uh, interest in cerebellum and showing how it's implicated in also uh, social cognitive uh, tasks, and. Uh, at the evolutionary level, uh, those results are also baked by uh, paleoanthropology and uh, amazing work uh, with uh, uh, Dublin and uh, Hublin and Guns on how the cranium uh, of uh, recent uh, Homo sapiens were uh, actively changed at the cerebellar level. And so by zooming even further, we actually uh, pinpoint at the single cell level that also the genes that were uh, actively diverging in Homo sapiens were genes implicated in micro and macrocephaly, so uh, morphogenesis associated genes. And uh, interestingly also, uh, there were not, it was not a question of just um, having more cells or more layers 
uh, like uh, some would have argued that artificial neural network would just need more data and more layers. Here is really a, a more complex picture implicated uh, specifically certain type of cells. Uh, and I would finish uh, on that because it, it connect with uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Changeux uh, work uh, before even he, he developed uh, with the Saint de Han, uh, the global neural workspace uh, theory uh, on synaptic epigenesis and how uh, the combination of uh, features that we see in evolution uh, implicated uh, both developmental expansion of the cortical layers and uh, prolonged uh, postnatal brain development, uh, that these changes are also associated with interaction with physical, social, and cultural environment. And so like we are really in the sandwich between this uh, biological grounding that evolved, but uh, we should not neglect this social and cultural environment where we are embedded and that this uh, extended neoteny in human allow to uh, integrate even more. So this is the last slide. Uh, I would say that I, I, I reuse uh, the diagram for social neuroscience and social interaction, uh, but this time for AI and saying that maybe social neuro AI beyond uh, helping for, for instance, in robotics with imitation learning or uh, in multi-agent reinforcement learning uh, scheme can represent a, an interesting uh, road to understand how uh, we are building our own uh, cognition in regard to uh, interaction with others. And beyond that, uh, to support, the, to flip this problem of uh, artificial intelligence and consciousness by trying to make machine more aware of other people, uh, maybe help uh, making machines aware of uh, themselves. So thank you very much uh, for the attention. Thank you, Guillaume, for the fascinating talk. This was uh, lovely. So we have a little bit of time for one or two questions. So we'll jump right in. So the first question here is from Paolo Barazza. Uh, and uh, it goes as follows. How can you empirically show that brain-to-brain -brain coupling is not just an epiphenomenon? OK. So well, that's a very common. Uh, question, uh, I would say that using uh, computational models, as I show uh, in the talk, uh, you can see that there is different uh, layers of similarity that can be observed by interbrain synchronization, uh, the similarity of the dynamics and the structure. But uh, what is not spurious is when this variation is correlated to an active exchange of information between the two systems. So I totally agree with that. And there have been a lot of hype in a hyper scanning uh, with people saying like, oh yeah, we have interbrain synchronization, but actually it's not surprising at all. Uh, to have no interbrain synchronization, you would need to have two random number generators. And since we are sharing our brain anatomy, uh, at some point we are always uh, synchronized with other conspecifics. Yeah, agreed. Okay, moving on to uh, another question from Abilash, um, uh, would you be doing any experiments with cooperative agents performing a task together with their neural activity causally perturbed between, be, via, say, TDCS or TMS? And if so, what areas would you likely target? Well, that's, that's a very, very funny question because uh, I'm actually uh, uh, using my startup uh, package here to actually move from correlational to uh, causal and stimulation and that's the next uh, step actually uh, to uh, have hyper stimulation uh, there is like uh, Giacomo Novembre for instance that have uh, started to investigate that and show that with using transcranial alternative current stimulation we can mm -hmm. uh, have a causal impact of inter-individual coordination huh. uh, but so that's uh, yeah with uh, moving from two to uh, three and more plus the causal level, that's the two next frontiers to me. Lovely, that's exciting. All right, so maybe one last question here from, um, let's see, from Karim, just based on the uh, number of votes here. Awareness of others inherent to social interactions is key to developing your own concept of consciousness, not only self-consciousness. Uh, does this mean we can forget about conscious machines or we should be trained in societies, machine, multiple interaction agent, 
Uh, oh my God, what long questions. Actually, I think you, you actually touched on that in your last slide, right? Like the idea yes. of having machines that, that are aware of others, right? Yeah, that would be more like the uh, Michael Graziano take that uh, we have the same uh, biological makeup to understand others. And actually from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes a lot of sense to argue that there is a lot of evolutionary advantage to deal with other behavior in the first place. And uh, I would agree, I would uh, even support that there is a kind of recycling or hacking of this uh, mechanism for understanding other that uh, has been hijacked through evolution to have mm -hmm. self-awareness and metacognition about ourselves. And so that's why uh, at the end, I'm kind of saying that uh, maybe social neuroi AI would be a, a good way to uh, make machine aware of themselves by uh, first trying to make them aware of others. Yeah, lovely. Well, on that note, which I think is very uh, inspirational, uh, we'll um, adjourn for a break. There should be a, a link that appears here for uh, Gather Town, as usual, if you want to um, uh, go and enjoy a little break with others. And we'll reconvene uh, in about 10 minutes at 3.30 here Eastern time for our final keynote from uh, Dr. Daniel Bassett. See you all in a second. And thank you again, Guillaume, for the great talk. Thank you. See you.